Section 3, the conclusion to the work. <clears throat> These are the principal thinkers he's referring to to pull together the history of the restoration of Platonic theology. And uh, I guess all we need is a couple of good quotes from each of these. And we can proceed. Uh, let's see if the, the right way to proceed. Uh, Daniel, do you think we should call on Igmar first? Of course. Okay. It's been suggested that uh, you give us a statement from your reading from each one of these thinkers so we can speed up the whole thing. Um, I haven't been reading the text, though. Oh, you made a mistake. But if you want someone to read out loud, I'd like no. <laughs> Come, like, what did you find? What did you find? This is where we're going. Come on. This is his big conclusion. These are the people he quotes, especially others on page 230. Hey, um, <clears throat> I wondered whether or not we could get uh, someone, a volunteer, to talk about what does this mean? What does the title mean? What can you legitimately expect from such a title? You can expect that there was a restoration. Oh, one. And that uh, this is going to be, there was a restoration of Platonic theology. So that therefore, and this is a history of it. Ah. At the least, I would say those two. Ah. So then. We're looking at this, then, all right? Uh, right, that's right. It should be, so we can presume that at one point it was up there, in full bloom, and then something happened, and, and then we were picking it back up again. And right. these thinkers are likely to be where, then? Uh, they should on be the bottom. Digital. On the bottom, or the? No, they should be either at the top, yeah. or they should be turning points, or they should be yeah. levels of uh, growth, or yeah. they should play some significant role. Right, right, right. So we'll even make that more so. And we can assume when he chooses the word theology rather than philosophy, given the time that this is written, uh, them kind of fighting work because mm -hmm. of the, the religious climate at the time. That that, that shapes mm. what he's trying to do. No. No. <clears throat> that can go in two ways, can't it? Since he translated and often quotes and sees the significance of Proclus' elements of theology. All right, so it, go, it can go two ways, right? Uh, and it can also go, of course, to the theos uh, as a study of the gods or the Platonic gods, if one took it that way, hmm. or the religious expression of the Platonic tradition. Uh -huh. Any of these four ways. But the big thing would still be restoration. So then, at this point, uh, it looks like we're getting more uh, the build up too. Huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what are the kinds of uh, stories or comments does he make about each of these people? Is it likely that some of you have read some of these people? Is that likely? Oh, let me do that again. Oh. Let me ask you. 
Is it possible that in your reading you have identified <clears throat> at least something that these authors have written mm -hmm. that you found significant and thought worthy of reflecting on? The reason I ask that is that what he, is that what he is citing for this hmm. model he's creating, or does he <laughs> you find it curious that he may be quoting or citing totally different things about these people that you never knew? Hmm. When we're stuck with something like this, we need help. We do. Yeah. I know, I do. And Igmar already said, not him. <laughs> Would you get a volunteer? Pass the buck in our noble tradition? Uh, David? David. <laughs> well, I've actually, I, I managed to read the first four lines since I got here, and there's not a whole heck of a lot that in those four lines identifies this conversation. So. Mm. Why don't you Got it. Daniel has a crystal ball. <laughs> and he's able just with a wave of his hand bring all kinds of wisdom literature up to the Is that right, Daniel? Something like that. See? Something like that. What have you found? Could you help us with this? What's the question? Well, let's, all right, let's, 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 let me make it, uh, um, would you agree we're on page 223? Yes, mm -hmm. okay. section three. Would you agree just glancing at it, that right off the top you can say he's talking about a celebrated disciple of Porphyry? Right on. Mm -hmm. Right? Well, which it happens to be? Iamblichus. Agree? That's the way it started? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have here. Right? Well, please, as you look at this, um, where do you see the author, Thomas Taylor, referencing Iamblichus? on 224. Now, let's put it together. Right. Okay. Oh, is it a philosophical profile? Is it a psychological profile? Is it a combination? What is he doing? It's kind of mm -hmm. a biographical... Uh, biographical? character profile. What does he pull out that's so, you know, worthy of reflection? And it was so divine he could literally levitate. His mind was beyond the material around completely. Okay. That's why, that's a great quote. Would you agree? It's right in the middle of 223, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. In your reading of Iamblichus, is that new to you? Wow. Yeah. Good. All right. What would you call it if you had to put a title on it? Extraordinary experiences that people have reported about this man called Iamblichus? Then is he quoting, is he, at this point is he digging into his philosophy? No. Not yet. Yeah. Oh. Let me do that again. Oh. So look. Um, we need a reader. You play, play the, play, okay. Uh, from the top of the page? No, no, no. no. Uh, they addressed him as follows, about eight lines down from the first paragraph. Why? Got it? Why, O oh divine master? No. Why, O oh divine master, do you thus act alone without communicating to us your most consummate wisdom? Yet it has been reported to us by your servants that you have been seen while engaged in prayer elevated more than 10 cubits from the ground, your body and garments at the same time being changed into a golden color, and that when your prayers have been finished, your body has returned to its pristine form, and descending to the earth, you have associated and discoursed with us as before. Upon this, Iamblichus laughed, 
though he was not addicted to laughter, and replied, He who invented this false relation was not unpleasant, but in future nothing shall be transacted without you. So, look on now, you have to conclude. Here's the, here's the story. Iamblichus reflects on it, and he writes about it. Would you conclude? But it wasn't true. It looks like it wasn't true. Yes, it was looks true. like it wasn't true. That's very <laughs> helpful. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, is it likely that while talking about Iamblichus, he now talks about Eunapus? If so, what story do we get there? Right between them. See, please look at that first sentence. It's, re it's rather revealing, isn't it? Come on, take a look. The two following circumstances relative to the theological powers of this wonderful man are related by Eunapius, which the reader may credit or reject as he pleases. Hmm. Oh. So he's into theurgy, isn't he? Right? Theurgy? Right? Okay. Um, what do you think of this story? What does it reveal? The big question is, was it theurgy that is at work in this story? Come on, stay with it. It doesn't look like it was the theurgy that was at stake here, or was it issued? Does it look like he, no. no. But the presumption, the way in which he describes it, this should be an example it of theurgy. should be an example. Mm -hmm. right, right, right. And he does. He says, let us take another road. Yeah, that's all. Because something's coming we should not want yeah. to be involved with. Yeah, so okay. So see the future. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. The second is more wonderful than the present. Mm -hmm. Right, on page 225, what do you dig? This is the one I like above all. Right. Of all the people, he's far more wonderful. Perhaps the sight and smell of Iamblichus was more powerful than that of his disciples. Well, that's good. Look, same point. Look, we're getting another story, aren't we? Does it reveal his philosophy? What is it revealing? What is his interest now? Okay. Um, Want to read the, the quote, the story, Barbara? Okay. Um, About a third down on 225. Okay, drop. Yeah, go ahead. Well, see. Uh, okay. His associates, therefore, not satisfied with this testimony of his extraordinary powers, were desirous to try him in a greater affair. And upon soliciting Iamblichus for this purpose, he replied that a proof of this kind was not dependent on his own will, but must be referred to a proper opportunity. In a short time after this, they all went to Gadara in Syria, a place so famous for baths that after Baye, Baye in Campania, it is the second in the Roman Empire. Here a dispute concerning baths arising while they were bathing, Iamblichus smiling said to them, Though what I'm about to disclose is not pious, 
yet for your sakes it shall be undertaken. And at the same time, he ordered his disciples to inquire of the natives what appellations had formerly been given, had been formerly given to two of the hot fountains, which were indeed less than the others, but more elegant and graceful. Upon inquiry, they found themselves unable to discover the cause of their nomination, but were informed that the one was called Eros, or love, and the other Antiros, or the god who avenges the injuries of love. Iamblichus immediately touching the water with his hand, for he sat perhaps on the margin of the fountain, and murmuring a few words, raised from the bottom of the fountain a fair boy of a moderate statue, whose hair seemed to be tinged with gold, and the upper part of whose breast was of a lumin luminous appearance. His companions being astonished at the novelty of the fair, let us pass on, says he, to the next fountain. And at the same time he arose, fixed in thought, and performing the same ceremonies as before, called forth the other love, who was in all respects similar to the former, except that his hair, scattered in his neck, was blacker, and was like the sun in refulgence. At the same time, both the boys eagerly embraced Iamblichus, as if he had been their natural parent, but he immediately restored them to their proper seats, and when he had washed, departed from the place. After this affair, the astonishment of him, his familiars and disciples was so great that they had submitted to the doctrines of Iamblichus with implicit assent. Okay. Okay. What kind of story? Philosophy or what's similar to all of theirs? Okay. Allegorical. Kind of Ripley's believe it or not. They're allegorical. Their stories not particularly of what a person is, but what he can do. Well, don't they remind you of the stories of the some of the Yogis who can manifest jewels, or mm. um, <coughs> you know, or the Patanjali's <coughs> Yoga yep. Sutras, where they talk about what you can do at different levels, yep. and they're, so they're like that kind yep. of. Thing. Yep. But um, we now need to get the comment of the author or the source of these stories. Mm. Now, Thomas you Taylor is sir. quoting. Okay, let's do the next sentence, David. Before you move on, let me mm. just try to say one more thing about. John. Um, the guy seems to be um, so deeply involved in the contemplation and the um, study of these things that it brings about all sorts of interesting states of mind and powers. But at the end of every story, he seems to just blow the whole thing off. And it takes on kind of the cast of, cast of those stories you hear in the Zen records, the blue clip. Record, the Mumon Khan, about a guy who, you know, at the end we got a colon out of it. Huh. Very nice guy. Okay. All right. All we need is a good conclusion. Keep going. Eunipius observes that other extraordinary particulars were related of Iamblichus, but that they had too much the appearance of fables sorry, to be combined with historical veracity. Good heavens, what has he just made? What statement? Mm -hmm. That these could be considered of what? Fables. 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 Yeah. Huh, that's rather curious, isn't it? Oh. But it looks. But uh, notice this last <coughs> phrase. But they had too much the appearance of fables to be combined with historical veracity. However, he's saying that about the other stories, not the two just related. Right? Well, I think you're quite right. Uh, Such that he actually believed these to have historical veracity. The two. Yeah, would you just, in order to make that point, would you read the preceding sentence? Um, at the same time, both the boys eagerly embraced Iamblichus as if he had been their natural parent that he immediately restored, restored them to their proper seats and when he had washed, departed from the place. So what do the people around him do? They believed it? Yes, the astonishment of the familiars and disciples was so great, they submitted oh, to the doctrines. Of and the therefore, uh, our colleague is asking to take a look at the following sentence. We want to look at the word other, don't we, in that sentence? Yeah. Oh. What's the force of other? Well, that the, the, the 
Well, I think the force of other is somewhat balanced by the force of too much the appearance of fables. No. Right? So there's a group that are too much like fables, but these are not too much like fables. <laughs> so since he has eyewitnesses, he's saying he's going to believe them. No. Yeah. Right, they should. Yeah. But wait a minute. Our author is using this for this purpose, to explain right. something. And it's supposed to be an example of theurgy. Yes. And it's not and, clear. And it's precedingly an example of theurgy. Right, right, right. Because he says the two following circumstances are relative to the related of the theurgical powers of this man. No. All right. So hold that. How about our next thinker? Contemporary of Iamblichus. Right. So we're going to get another... And what do you make of that? We're now on page 226. Agree? <clears throat> right. Kind of Dharma combat in this story. Is that correct as you look at it? What do you say? He's building a case. Right, confrontation. How about that? Does he center it in this one line? While I amplicus on this occasion waited rather to be interrogated than to propose a question himself. Huh? Uh, mm -hmm. Want to keep going? Alethius, contrary to the expectation of everyone, relinquishing philosophical discussions and seeing himself surrounded with a theater of men, turned to Iamblichus and said to him, Tell me, O philosopher, is the rich man unjust? or the heir of the unjust. For in this case, there is no medium. But Iamblichus, hating the acuteness of the question, replied, this kind of disputation, O illustrious man, relative to external concerns, is foreign from our philosophical mode, since we alone propose as subjects of speculation characters replete with philosophic virtue. After he had said this, he departed. And at the same time, all the surrounding multitude was immediately dispersed. But Iamblichus, collecting himself when alone, and admiring the acuteness of the question, often privately resorted to Alethius, whom he had vehemently extolled for the subtlety of his judgment and the sagacity of his genius, and whose life he historically and copiously delineated. This Alethius was an Alexandrian by birth, and died in his own country, worn out with age. And after him, Iamblichus, leaving behind him many roots and fountains of philosophy, which, through the cultivation of succeeding Platonists, produced a fair variety of vigorous branches and copious streams. Same question. Hmm. Well, he sure doesn't seem deeply skilled in dialectic from this story. See, same question. Does this show philosophy? What is he doing? What is our author doing? It's a very odd thing to show, you know, to show him not questioning, making a comment and leaving, <coughs> and then in private pursuing it, right? Yeah, yeah. And not then showing the private discourse. Uh -huh. So you don't see whether he had any skill in dialectic at all. That's right. But he seems rather like someone who is interested in appearances. Yeah, but what kind of appearances? You're right. Mm. Okay, so again, would you say, now this is a great set of quotes you can use to explore the philosophical content of these thinkers. 
<laughs> no. Well, then we want to know what is he doing. No. Isn't he trying to describe the character I think of the kind of guy who would be doing this kind of thinking if he managed to get to those places, this man states he gets, you know, to some kind of supreme, what do you call that first guy? It certainly. Sure if you really get there and you really do it, then this will be a prosopography. This will be the life of a philosopher, you know, with profundity and yeah. succinctness. And, and he ain't quoting their philosophy. He's, no. he's giving stories about their sure. character and how they're living and how they deal with people who confront them. Right. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this really shows, therefore, the restoration of Platonic theology. Oh, Sooner or later. Sooner or later. <laughs> oh, he will, by the way. No, no, he will. Well, these, uh, these figures are sort of uh, they're the equivalent, platonic equivalent of saints. We're getting their exemplary. Saints. That's good. This is sort of a, ah, a list of saints. Mm -hmm. That's right. And uh, could you risk the term perhaps miraculous stories? However they deal with it, whether it's true or not, whether the event really took place or not, is not as important as giving the story and leaving it to the reader. Even though he as a writer questions it, but then balances it. So let look here. How about 228? <laughs> Now, okay, you got a couple of great lines in here. Now, this difference in the mode of unveiling the Platonic theology, just what we need, right? What does he mean by Platonic theology, and what would happen if you, as it were, reveal it, yeah. unveil it? Got the, got the sound about six lines down from the top? Mm -hmm. Are you still good for working? Sure. Please. Now, this difference in the mode of unveiling Platonic theology is perfectly agreeable to the state of the Roman Empire and the new religion at the periods when those modes were adop adopted, in the times of Plotinus and Porphyry, when Gallienus and Diocletian swayed the scepter of the world, Rome was in the middle of her course to destruction, and Christianity had nearly accomplished one half of her journey to ecclesiastical empire. However, as neither the fall of Rome nor the establishment of Christianity were then absolutely certain, these philosophies were cautious in disclosing all that a baser period might require. This period, the Amplicus was destined to see approach under the reign of the empire, Emperor Constantine, when the new religion, sorry, this period, Iamblichus was destined to see approach under the reign of the Emperor Constantine when the new religion was established and the old treated with ridicule and contempt. Indeed, the new religion had no sooner ascended the throne and assumed the reins of arbitrary power, but she was, a sur but she was surrounded with myriads of unphilosophic converts, and in her progress to despotism, drew after her the capital of Rome, and at once fixed the destruction of its ancient empire. And thus we may see that the writings of Iamblichus were perfectly correspondent to the depravity of the times. Hmm. The times are depraved, right? Hey, he's going to give us this. He's, of course, he's going to mention again Proclus, right? as he does. Um, but now we're in the decline. Now he's going to talk about this. What is it that brought about the fall? Well, let's take a look. Um, this, uh, let's see how this progress to despotism continued. Uh, the most celebrated from there? Yeah, yeah, if you'd like, please. Sure. Yeah, fine. The most celebrated disciple of Amplicus <coughs> appears, appears to have been one Odysseus, a Cappadocian, who was of noble birth but, as is generally the case with philosophers, possessed but a slender estate. I must be one then. 
According, <laughs> according, according to Eunapius, who wrote his life, he was not much inferior to Amblichus, except in a divine afflatus, which seems to have been peculiar to that illustrious hero. To Odysseus, we may add Maximus and Dexippus, Dexippus both disciples of Amblichus, and frequently cited by Simplicius in his elaborate commentary on the predicaments of Aristotle. But here we, most, here we must regret that none of the immediate successors of Iamblichus contributed anything to the advancement of the ancient theology. They reverenced indeed the arduous flights and the divine genius of their master, but never attempted even to imitate what they could not equal, and were content to grovel without presuming, presuming to soar. The iniquitous, iniquitous times indeed of the emperor Constantine may afford a reasonable apology for the decay of genius and the languor of philosophy. The destructive rod of ecclesiastical empire was already extended, and its lethargic influence was already felt on the active spirit of liberal investigation. Religious faction had now st started from the bosom of delusion. Religious faction had now started from the bosom of delusion and holy persecution was hastening from the infernal seats to massacre the nations and deluge Europe and Asia in blood. The peaceful and instructive disputes of philosophers were now beginning to be exchanged for the jargon of orthodox and heterodox sectaries. And the calm voice of ancient theology was silenced by the barbarous and tumultuous sounds of Arian and Trinitarian clamors. This alarming change, however, checked only for a short period the generous ardor of the philosophic genius. For the era was now at hand in which theology was destined to display the full blaze of her celestial light. Sacred zeal indeed presumed to hurl the darts of faith against her venerable person. But her arm was destitute of vigor and her wep weapons fell innocent to the ground. The buckler of true theology was not to be transpierced by such imbecile darts, and the attempt was like that of weak old Priam against the young and youthful Pyrrhus. We can get David to read. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you translate it? Yeah, something about throwing a shield. Uh, let's see. Uh, um, uh, poor guy throws an unwarlike uh, dart with a, with a toss, uh, which uh, immediately uh, the, uh, was repelled by the branch, raucous branch. From the very navel of the uh, shield, it came purposely. Mm -hmm. oh, no. Purposelessly. Purposelessly. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the English. Mm -hmm. So, by the way. They stormed the um, castle and the citadel of Troy. Mm -hmm. Pyrrhus was the first one into the breach when they stormed the tower and took Pyrrhus's life, Priam, Priam's life, while he and his wife and his children mm -hmm. huddled around the altar and uh, decapitated him. And first killed his son yeah. in front of his eyes. Yeah. So this is what's going on um, yeah. you know, locally at this time. Yeah, he's saying, hey. We're already we're already deep in the decline, and at right, this is <coughs> the period of Justinian. I uh, pardon me, Constantine. Uh, boom! Next sentence. Next couple of sentences. Let's see what he says. But the order of discourse now brings us to to a survey of the last branch of the theological tree. 
in which we may discover amidst numerous ramifications and elegant foliage, exhaustless vigor and luxuriant fruit. The source of this illustrious branch was the great Athenian Plutarch, of whom much honorable mention has been made in the preceding life of Proclus. To Plutarch succeeded Syrianus and Olympiodorus, and to these Hermias and Proclus. It was by the labors of this last philosophical hero that theology received the consummation of excellence and exhibited diffused elegance combined with majesty and strength. This will be evident from perusing his life and studying his more abstruse writings, among which the following elements may be deservedly ranked. Do you want the rest of it? Mm -hmm. So Marin, though Marinus, as we have observed in the life of Proclus, was his immediate successor, yet Asclepiodotus, the master of Demasius, was his best disciple and was the most capable of receiving the exuberant streams of wisdom which vigorously flowed from his philosophic mind. After Asclepiodotus, an illustrious series of philosophers succeeded who terminated the golden chain of Platonists and were the last advocates for the dignity of ancient wisdom and theology. These great men were Xenodotus, Severianus, Ammonius, Hermias, Hierius, Asclepius, Simplicius, Isidorus, Demasius, Diogenes, Eulalius, and Priscian. But of all these, none except Damasius appears to have contributed anything to the perfection of theology. For the works of the rest consist for the most part in excellent commentaries on Aristotle. But Damasius, in his book on principles, has preserved a most valuable store of recondite wisdom and unfolded some of the sublimest, sublimest mysteries of ancient theology. This inestimable work is, however, still in manuscript and is not likely in the present age to emerge from its shameful concealment. So it's in, in its decline, it's already declining. I say, hey, here's Damascus. Proclus, Marinus, right, and of course uh, Plutarch, right. You're saying oh, here they are, mm -hmm. in the middle of this, and now what are we going to get? The drudge. More. More decline. Yeah. You're doing well. We get another reader, or are you sure. good for another? Yeah, either way. Go ahead, go ahead. I like the opening of the next line. So go ahead. Seven of the preceding. Yeah. Seven of the preceding illustrious heroes who were united by friendship as well as philosophy, Demasius the Syrian, Simplicius the Sicilian, Cilician, Eumenius the Phrygian, Priscian the Lydian, Hermias and Diogenes of Phoenicia, and Isidorus of Gaza, disgusted with the religion of their sovereign Justinian, right. discerned disgusted his, with the religion of with Christianity. Of Christianity. Right. And now he's going to go and further stack it up. Go ahead. Determined to seek from Khosrows, the Persian king, that liberty of conduct which their native country denied. Khosrows, though a barbarian, was deeply skilled in the philosophy of Plato and Aristotle, and was so imbued with the dogmata of Plato that not one of his abstruse dialogues escaped his penetrating genius. The ill success, however, of these philosophers in their journey to Persia gives us reason to suspect that the philosophic attainments of Crossroads were influenced more by pride than the love of truth, and that he affected the name without possessing the requisites of a sage. The return of these philosophers was precipitate, and their disappointment extreme. They derived, however, a considerable advantage from their ex expedition, and the conduct of Crossroads in this particular will confer immortal honor on his character and name. He was the means of procure, procuring for the seven sages an exemption from the barbarous penal laws of Justinian against the pagans, and thus enabled them to end their days in security and peace, and in the enjoyment of that liberty of conscience which no religion before the Christian 
ever attempted to destroy. He's uh, building a case. Mm -hmm. And from now on, he's now going to continue it and wrap it up. Another, Mark, you want to jump in? Do some? Sure. All right, Justinian. Remember, he's the one who closed the schools of the academy in 529. So here we go. Give this part to me. <laughs> the reign of Justinian, indeed, as it firmly established the Christian religion, terminated the glorious empire of philosophy by suppressing the schools of Athens and suspending the ecclesiastical sword over the heads of heathen theologists. But the fall of philosophy was naturally succeeded by the darkness of delusion and ignorance, by the spirit of wild fanaticism and intolerant zeal, by the loss of courage and virtue, and by the final dissolution of the empire of the world. She was ruined indeed, but not without revenge. War, pestilence, and famine were the scourges of a prince who had presumed to demolish her schools and intercept the diffusion of her sacred light. And his reign was disgraced by an irreparable decrease of mankind in the most fertile regions of the earth. We may add, too, that his dominions were alarmed with the dreadful blaze of two mighty comets whose malignant light foretold approaching calamities in war, and signified perhaps the establishment of religious anarchy and the commencement of barbarous impiety and folly. And to complete this catalog of prodigies and desolation, every year of his reign was marked with violent earthquakes of uncommon duration and incredible extent. The whole surface of the Roman Empire was agitated with horrid internal convulsions, and enormous chasms were formed by the Earth's strong vibration. Large bodies were discharged into the air, and the sea concurring in the general ruin overflowed or deserted its natural bounds by alternately advancing and retreating with accumulated majesty and strength, and the mountain was torn from Libanus and hurled into the waves amidst the dreadful tossings of the deep. History after this period exhibits nothing but religious dissensions, despicable councils, and bigoted, bigoted sects, the enmity of saints, and the discord of Nestorians, and Jacobites, and Maronites, and Armenians, Copts, Abyssinians. Religious war and pious rebellion succeeded philosophical theory, and Nestor and Cyril led the confused and clamorous dance of ecclesiastical disputation. Mm -hmm. Pass the buck. Sure, that wore out my soul. <laughs> uh, he's on a roll, so it's going to go on for four more pages. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> It would neither be consistent with the design of this history, pleasing to the author, nor entertaining to the Platonic reader, to trace the rapid increase of barbarism and ignorance after the abolition of the Athenian and Alexandrian schools. Louder. <clears throat> it will be sufficient to observe that the jargon of innumerable sects established a tyranny unknown to the pagan world, the tyranny of religious despotism, and finally extirpated from the earth the dominion of ancient wisdom and virtue. From the incredible multitude of different persuasions, Christianity lost all appearance of a revelation, and by the conduct of its professors, seemed rather calculated to confound than illuminate mankind. The same infatuated spirit has indeed marked its progress to the present day. And we find that in proportion as this baneful zeal prevails, knowledge retires, virtue droops, and magnanimity is destroyed. Hypocrisy becomes the substitute for generosity, and whining can't, and whining can't succeeds the decent confidence inspired by genuine dignity and worth. As the rapidity 
of a river is increased by the contraction of its channel, so its vigor is diminished by the multiplication of its streams. In a similar manner, the influence of any religion is lessened when it is divided into various streams of opinion by the discord of party and the zeal of profession. The energy of the whole is lost by diffusion, and the river of the church is weakened by the numerous and narrow rivulets of dissenters. Experience unfortunately shews that the professors of a national religion are generally men of greater integrity than those who compose the dissenting sects. And the fact may be supported by a rational theory. The trifling employments, groveling cares, and contemptible fame, which are necessarily connected with religious dissension, unavoidably debilitate the mind and contract the heart. <clears throat> the whole attention is, is engrossed in regarding the little concerns and supporting the narrow opinions of a party, and that strength of understanding and integrity of character, which are requisite to acquire eminence in science and virtue, are lost in imbecile exertions and hypocritical cant. It is on this account that I should prefer a dissenter in Scotland and a papist in France to a dissenter and Catholic in England. For in those countries they cease to be sectaries and may consequently in some degree become virtuous and wise. He's going to pull all of these together under two names. Okay, go for one more. It seems at first sight surprising that there should be no sex among the Grecian polytheists. They were unanimous in their belief of a multitude of gods supported to one supreme. Their mode of worship was uniformly the same, and they appear to have had no conception of religious innovation. Shall we say that a religion is false in proportion to its unity, that truth may be branched out into an endless variety of discordant streams, <laughs> and that error alone resists the power of copious and confused division? <laughs> Such a speculation is indeed curious, but not safe, and its result would perhaps be more logical than orthodox, got a great line coming up. and more informing than discreet. Let us therefore direct our attention to a more important subject and consider the excellence of the Christian religion with respect to the commercial interests of mankind. <laughs> that Christianity is not favorable to philosophy, I mean that of the ancients, is, excuse me, is evident from its causing the destruction of the ancient schools, which it has not yet restored, though more than a thousand years have elapsed since their dissolution. Indeed, the wisdom of a sage is not likely to coincide with the doctrine of a fisherman. <laughs> and is that good? <laughs> is that a great line? Yeah. <laughs> and implicit faith ill suits with liberal doubt and severe investigation. However, the spirit of meekness, which Christianity so admirably inculcates, <coughs> though opposite to the dignity of philosophy, promotes the humility of merchandise and facilitates the emoluments of trade. It enables men to suppress their passions from considerations of interest, teaches them to refer everything to private advantage, and to consider magnanimity as a dangerous and arrogant virtue. It is to this spirit that we must ascribe the great extent of commerce in all the civilized parts of the world, and that Europe is much richer, though less wise, than of old. The spirit of meekness, by gradually suppressing the noble ardor of ancient heroism and withdrawing the attention from abstract investigations, as daring and presumptuous, has given birth to innumerable discoveries in the arts, unknown to the speculative genius of antiquity. Hence the luxuries of life have received an immense improvement, and the spirit of meekness, though not calculated to soar, has wandered over the surface of the earth and diffused its humble blessings even to the remote regions of the poles. Penetrating and smooth, it has crept like oil through the 
this spirit of meekness has crept like oil through the communities of mankind and increased the activity by lubricating the joints of the flexible body of commerce. Two. What? <laughs> Go ahead, I, I like this one. Go ahead. <laughs> As oil, too, allays the fury of the sea and calms its agitated waves, so meekness suppresses the effervescence of desire, restrains the restless spirit of inquiry, and calms the impetuosity of genius. Hence, though we are no longer surprised with the daring exploits and prodigious talents which distinguish the ancient world, yet we can boast a greater uniformity of character, a more general equality in moderate attainments, and a more interested spirit. In consequence of this universal mediocrity, our capacity for commerce is increased and our abilities enlarged for accumulating wealth by groveling pursuits. But the most important advantage acquired by the spirit of meekness is that mentioned by the great apostle of the Gentiles of becoming all things to all men. The benefits indeed which such a pliability of temper confers on a commercial kingdom compose so great a part of the arcana of traffic that revelation alone could have made mankind sensible of their importance. Meekness, like Proteus assumes, every possible appearance which the interest of concealment may require, and philosophy alone can trace it through its multiform shapes and vanquish its transforming power. Now, this goes on, right, for a couple of pages. Um, he then has fun knocking several people, especially someone he really enjoys knocking, which is uh, uh, Johnson, good old Boswell Johnson uh, issue. So why don't we get to the point where he's going to pull it together? Um, this does kind of make clear why he wasn't yes. so popular. Please, <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, you can see why he wasn't particularly liked among Christian so yeah, society. which was like major to that. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. He may have, in fact, been critical. <laughs> he did it so elegantly. Right, is that possible? He could r risk that opinion? Yeah. But you see, look, see. I think he found every word in the dictionary to describe see, it. He's making a contrast with these stories about ancient character, <coughs> and now he's pulling it away. Let's take a look at the modern character brought about by Christianity, and it's meekness and phony humbleness. Right? And mediocrity. With mediocrity, Great right? Making money. Right. So that's right. It's a character study, <coughs> ancient and modern. And let's skip what he does with Johnson, who's a boring idiot, anyhow. Uh, and take a look at what he's, how he pulls it together, right? Which is on 236, what do you think? Well, he's got several. Oh, by the way, if you have a couple of great lines you'd want to uh, read out loud, please uh, do so. I don't mean to cut it off. Uh, no, this is, this is the, some he's got some great lines in here too. You know. The knowledge of common things is alone the province of the common. <laughs> okay. And this much for a history of the restoration of the Platonic theology by the later Platonists. All right. Now, I can only add, this is where he now pulls it together. Take a look. I'm on 236. Go ahead, good, thank you. I only add that I am in no respect a debtor to the gratitude of the public. Uh, for my writings hitherto have neither been attentively studied nor liberally received. Solely influenced by the love of truth, I have endeavored to disseminate the wisdom of Greece and to draw aside the mystic veil of recondite theology. But experience has convinced me that the period of philosophy is past, and that some fortunate revolution can alone restore its fallen honors 
and establish its original sway. Okay, don't lose that. Okay, hold on to that. Keep going. Should the present work survive the literary wreck, which will probably precede the revival of philosophy, I shall consider myself amply rewarded for the toil of its execution, and I am not ashamed of owning that the pleasing hopes of such an event have inspired me with the patience and vigor requisite to so laborious an undertaking. In short, whatever may be its immediate or future success, my views have been liberal in the publication, and my mental advantages considerable from the study of ancient philosophy. Amidst the various storms of a life distinguished by outrage and disease, it has been a never-failing support and an inviolable retreat. It has smoothed the brow of care and dispelled the gloom of despondence, sweetened the bitterness of grief and lulled agony to rest. After reaping such valuable advantages from its acquisition, I am already rewarded though my labor should be unnoticed by the present and future generation. The liar of true philosophy is no less tuneful in the desert than in the city, and he who knows how to call forth its latent harmony and solitude will not want the testimony of the multitude to convince him that its melody is ecstatic and divine. Okay, what is he saying? <coughs> Great Mark, medicine. You jump in. <clears throat> During part of this, he's just given the middle finger to a lot of his critics. <laughs> but in the most recondite manner of speaking. Huh? It seems to be doing David, what, louder. It seems to be doing what he re admires in others, which is based on his contemplations and the depth of his chastity. He's pretty willing to predict what's going to happen next. There's a nice quote here where he, we, 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 met, we said goodbye to Am, the young Iamblichus. And thus we may see that the writings of Iamblichus were perfectly correspondent to the depravity of the time. Mm -hmm. He was able, and we know that's not Iamblichus, but we know that he was able to perceive exactly what was going on and predict what would come next. And I think that's what Thomas Taylor was saying in that last couple of And He's saying also, you know, even if nobody likes it, it's, it's been good to me. You know? Saving the soul. <clears throat> what does he think about this now? Come on. Okay, you're right, of course. But well, what's going to be this? What's going to do this? <coughs> Which is? A fortunate revolution. I might put the word true in front of that. It makes it right. Yeah, true restoration. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. Some guy like him is going to come along and do what he did, and that will be the restoration of philosophy. Yeah. That's what he's saying, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, he also says, should the present work survive the literary wreck, which will probably precede the ri revival of philosophy. <laughs> so there has to be a... Sure. A lot of that. Burn it all down. What's he going he thinks there's going to be a general crash. crash. He even <laughs> talked about oil slicks. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And I like this. I shall consider myself amply rewarded for the toil of its execution. And I am not ashamed of owning that the pleasing hopes of such an event have inspired me with the patience and vigor requisite to so laborious an undertaking. <laughs> he's, kind of, he's enjoying. Uh, That's like yeah. there's no spark of hope. More? What? That's like he's saying there is absolutely no spark of hope except for the least glowing ember left. Yeah. And for that reason, I'm going to plow through this. I'm <laughs> going to try. That's right. That's what he's saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but experience has convinced me that the period of philosophy is past. And that some fortunate revolution may alone restore its fallen honors and establish its original sway. He's waiting for a revolution. And what may precede it is another 
destructive fury. So, uh, on, take, take a couple of more quotes. What do you got? What do you want to focus on? Because we want to know, what does he think? What if I put in just one word? What does he think the future of the history of the restoration of philosophy will be? Can you could go back to it now? Can we pull all those things together? David made a couple of nice points. Several of you did. Can you come on? the present work survives a new destruction of all philosophy as it has in the past, right. I'll be duly satisfied. Is it fair to say that what he's saying, what he's coming to is that I don't care what's going to happen, it happened to me, something worthwhile happened to me when I, since I have been involved in it, I have been transformed, is that what he's saying? Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? yeah. Well then, the restoration of philosophy is getting into it. Jump in. Um, I, I guess I, I was attracted to the last line because um, he says the, the liar of true philosophy is no less tuneful in the desert than in the city. And he who knows how to call for its latent harmony and solitude will not want the testimony of the multitude to convince him that its melody is ecstatic and divine. I guess I, I understood that as you know, something that can be restored. Um, oh, come on. Well, so you got a good, you got a good sentence. Let's work on it. Come on. The last sentence. Work on it. David? It was a very nice invitation to begin the process right now. Oh. I think that, you know, oh. might, might be your read that. Within the self, it's rather than saying, having to get glory. If you want to do it, get to work. And you're not going to get paid. And you're going to do it by yourself. And you know, it's going to give you the exact same thing that all those other guys. No, you're saying, hey, there's a supreme part of the soul cultivated with philosophy. Right? That's the game. He did it. He said, that's the future. Is that he what he's doing? In the midst, yeah, he did it in the midst of all that turmoil. He did that in the middle of it. Right. So Woo! If we can do it uh, then, we can certainly Astonishing, do it right? Yeah. He's yeah. the model. Yeah, he's the model. Yeah. That's what he's saying. Hey, yeah, I'm the model. Do it my way. I'm the model, right? In other words, yes or no? Is he now giving you his character? Yes. Mm -hmm. Sure. In the end? Yep. Yes. Right? Now, if we want, we can compare his own description of his character with and compare it with meekness and humility that he portrays as the Christian character and the destructive fury it brought upon the earth? Yeah, yeah just on that, on that um, point, uh, this sentence right here uh, in about the middle, in short, whatever may be its immediate or future success, my views have been liberal in the publication. Mm -hmm. And my mental advantage is considerable from the study of ancient philosophy. Mm -hmm. Right, he's very clearly talking about yeah. his own state of mind. His own state of mind. Yeah. Back there's, to character. There's a bit of play there, I think, or sarcasm or irony. When you look at the volume of work this guy has gone through and the states of mind he must have been in throughout this whole process, he's got to be somewhere in, you know, 
closer to the Palfrey and Jim Yeah, yeah. we can put, and what he did with Book 7, revolution. yeah, and what he did with Book 7 of Proclus' Theology is astonishing. He rewrote it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's an astonishing piece of work. Makes him a full-class philosopher and translator rolled into an exceptional oneness. Well, we're out of it. Now, um, I got a request, and uh, uh, Sean urged me to uh, put it before you. He said, why don't you get the group here to decide on what to do next? Okay. Is that what you said? Absolutely. See? Smart guy. Where do you want to go? We got some things hanging in the air. What do you want? <laughs> go into dialogue. What? What do you want to do? Well, I, I, we we did talk about getting into one of the people that Thomas Taylor right here says was the spur of the group, and that was um, oh. Damasius or Damascus, how we pronounce his name. And well, we happen to have a work on Damascus, don't we? we Spent a lot of money on it. Okay, Damascus it is <laughs> on the principles. I'm just throwing it out. I mean, I'm Woo! Wow! Well, <laughs> now what do? Just get a taste of it. That's the big question. How will we decide after we hear a good idea? I don't know. Don't cry. It'll have to ring. Well, I think we, yeah. we don't really need to do any decision on that. Sounds like. Yeah. Vote on it, I guess. But sounds like a good idea. You don't have to decide. Flip a coin. Good ideas, ideas. You? Okay, I'll flip a coin. <laughs> I might ask if there's it somebody. Goes. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Damascus, next trip. It's a good idea. Uh, so what about... Uh, Sir, is, do we have it in hard copy? Um, oh yeah. I, I don't have a copy. Yeah. I think uh, Julie has a bunch of copies. Well, we also have Rod did uh, one of his printings, which was uh, you know Xerox copy way back when of the principles, and I'll pull it off and uh, make sure copies get around quick. Or give it to someone who has a good scanner and can just shoot it through. Where did you buy yours, Mark? Julie, you, you have one. Yeah, J Julie. Oh, I have one. Uh, she'll be gone. She'll be gone after Tuesday. Huh? Julie is gone after Tuesday. She's going back east. So if you want to get anything, get it to her before Tuesday. No, Pardon? That's, I'm sure that's holidays. I, I, he's saying oh, is that goodbye, and I said I think that's holidays probably. Okay. She can do what she wants, but I, you know. I, it's not goodbye forever. <laughs> you're not saying that. <laughs> what, 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 what point were you making uh, up here? Pardon me? What point were you making about Julia? Get the book before she leaves. Well, there's also this copy that Rod made years ago. And it's a shorter version, a very brief version, on the principles. And I can get copies made of it if it's okay with you guys. Just go down and get them, make 20 copies. and. No. How many people need a copy? How many need a copy? I think I do. Uh, a lot of people do. <laughs> okay. That, count them. It comes Where out to be found? some. <laughs> Again, raise your hands. I want to be accurate. Some. And then okay. they're going to pick up the cost of it? Yes. Yeah. I yeah. certainly will. Pick yeah. up the cost. Yeah. 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 Would have to be money on the table. Pick up the cost. <laughs> <Pick up. laughs> Remember, our principal, if there's anything left over, beer. <laughs> beer. Right? Philosophical beer. Yeah, yes. <laughs> philosophical. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys, fun. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you. Great. Another day. Greatly fun. Yeah.